Austin Baker and Jacob Christie. Yep. Uh, I used to work in desktop support, came from a kind of sysadmin background, yep. eventually sold out, became a consultant. Now I forensicate doing that. And uh, I'm a great patron of the coffee arts, as I'm sure many of you all are. And if anybody else in the crowd has a boxer dog, then you're my new best friend. Sorry, Matt. I tried. Uh, and I am Austin Baker. I'm sure most of you don't know who I am, but that's okay. Hopefully I'll get to know you. But uh, so I originally started out um, about four years ago doing forensics and incident response. And I learned from actually a lot of people here, a lot of great resources, learned a lot. Um, I slowly started moving into uh, the pen testing red teaming side. And that's primarily where I spend most of my time. But I still have a very deep passion for forensics. And in fact, most of my red teaming is very forensically driven these days. So uh, hopefully we can combine that together. And this is a picture of my cat, because I'm a little bit more of a cat person than a boxer person. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Obligatory <laughs> cat picture. Great, so let's get into it. Uh, this is sort of the agenda. We're not gonna bore you by walking through each of these bullet points because we're going to actually walk through them as we go. Yeah. Um, but we thought we'd start off with this little nugget. Yeah, so everyone's had that experience where you sit down and you're like, all right, time to forensicate. Then you look and you see there's only one event log left on the system. So, so it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, it is. It's great. So event logs, they're great. You know, we've extolled their virtues for years. What are they used for? Well, we can find log in, log out, uh, connecting to a network share, remote desktop, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, process created, as I think uh, they were alluding to in the earlier talk. Uh, service installation, start stop. Great stuff. And if you're really, really cool, there's even PowerShell logging. Yeah. Turns out logs are really great resources. Um, the only issue with logs, and, and there are some other artifacts as well, but the primary issue with logs, in, in my opinion, is because they're so powerful and because they're so explicit about the activity that they track, you don't have to do a lot of interpreting for some of these log sources. Uh, we tend to take them at face value. Um, you know, most people, when they look at event logs, parse them and put them into a timeline. Uh, they don't think to themselves, well, how do I trust that the event ID that's part of this is actually correct? How do I trust that the user that said to have logged in is actually the user that did? Um, and it's a little bit of a dilemma because you know, typically you know the system's been compromised or the system was operated by a malicious user, yet the forensic artifacts that belong to the system belong to the person who compromised it. They have the ability to uh, mess around with or alter those forensic artifacts. And we already have several great examples of file system artifacts. There was a great presentation last year at this very conference about all the different ways that someone can try to hide the fact that a file was on a system from you. Um, but not a lot of people talk about event logs, um, which is unfortunate, but hopefully we can talk, start that conversation today because they are a great resource, but you want to have some degree of caution about using them without interrogating the validity of the event logs as well as tracking attacks uh, against the integrity of those event logs, either by removing them or altering them. I think it's somehow like event logs are the least sexy anti-forensic technique. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, so given that, why should we care? Uh, so we have uh, evidence that advanced threat actors have used all kinds of levels of clearing event logs from the very basic that we'll start with up to the very complicated that we'll get into. Mm. Um, in order to sort of manipulate the trace that they were there in the first place. There are also now publicly available tools uh, that have sort of come to light that show how to remove or alter these event logs. And um, addressing these and sort of looking through your environment and seeing where this might happen might cue you in as to uh, other things that might be going on that you otherwise might not have known about. Right, so hopefully, you know, by the end of this goal, our, or by the end of this talk, our goal is to establish the different techniques that both red teams, uh, in some special cases, and attackers have actually been seen using um, to manipulate or hide event logs from you, the forensicator, uh, determine if there are any forensic artifacts that might be recovered that tips you off to the fact that that occurred, and discuss larger scale recommendations, more strategic recommendations, to ensure that the sources of information you're pulling and, and your typical tactics for doing forensics don't fall prey to any malicious manipulation of these log sources. Barring that, we might just make you really hate our right, talk. Right, yeah, hopefully and... yeah. Hopefully, you don't walk out of this uh, feeling really bummed about event logs. Yeah, yeah. So we'll start with the uh, old trusty. You know, the audit log was cleared, event ID 1102 for the curious. 
Uh, this is what we like to think of as the lazy person's anti-forensics. Uh, you know, you go in, you do all your stuff, it all gets logged, and then on your way out the door, maybe as an afterthought, you just, I'll clear all these logs. In. Yeah, just toss a match through the door as you're walking yeah, out. Yeah, why not? Uh, so it's noisy, it's, it records itself doing it, but it's extremely common for, uh, you know, different versions of actors out there, all different levels of threat, and it gets the job done. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, so how can we work around this? Well, we can correlate other things that might have happened on disk at the time. Uh, we can look at other artifacts, you know, that, that may have come before or after the alt log was cleared. And we can also try to look at our sim and see what might have been forwarded before the, uh, you know, right. auto log was cleared. So, so this, is, this is the one part of this that I think there is a lot of conversation about. There are a lot of great tools out there that look to recover things like event logs from memory, recover scraps of event logs from disk, tools like EVTX Extract, um, that are already out there, that are great tools, that are part of this particular problem, part of the reason why those tools were created um, was the fact that this was so easy, so trivial to do. So, you know, those areas are typically covered. So we want to spend the most of our time talking about other techniques that aren't quite as obvious. Yeah, so moving on from there. Right. So uh, everyone here uh, probably knows that there are several configuration options that you can put for your event log providers. Um, one of the most important of those is the maximum size that the log can hold. So you probably have seen in the past, this is a technique that some attackers have used, where they simply just drop the size to lower than the current existing size and basically truncate the log and just release all the rest of the data. Now, there's an interesting uh, new option that's actually supported natively in PowerShell where you can actually change the retention option to prevent the log from being written to with new events. So the combination of the old technique and, and sort of the new more accessible technique is to shrink the log past its current size so that it's the smallest it can possibly be and change the retention policy so that no new logs get added to it. After you've done that, you can basically do whatever you want on the system, maybe exfiltrate, move laterally, log in, log out, um, and as long as that uh, policy holds, no new logs will get pushed to that except for the one log that states that the log configuration was changed. So, after you're, right, so after you're done, um, after you're done with all of your malicious activity, you simply take off the retention policy to allow new logs to keep flooding in, they roll off everything that was in the small log, and then you pop the size back up to its normal size, and as far as anyone's considered, nothing happened. The big nice hole in your right. log a big timeline. a big timeline gap. Although yeah. if you're doing forensics, you know, several weeks after the incident, you may not even notice that there's a gap. And so it's uh, it might be hard to see, but there's actually just basically a one liner. Right. There's a one line PowerShell out. command to do this, and yeah. you can see the immediate effect is that all the logs are now truncated, and no new logs are going to be written. So this presents sort of uh, two challenges to the investigator. How do I figure out if this happened, and what do I do about it? Uh, so how you can detect it, detect, or detect it actively is to uh, sort of look for any of those registry changes. So as Austin noted, if you've got the retention change and you've got the max size change, these actually get recorded in the registry. And again, it's going to be kind of hard to see there, but they're, um, they're in there with max size and with uh, retention. Mm. Specifically, that gets changed to all Fs. Right, retention gets, will get changed to all Fs when it's set to ignore all new logs, never write new logs. Yeah, so hang on to everything I've already got in that event log. Yeah, and, and these make great sources. So if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have some sort of endpoint monitoring technology, WMI event hooking into these different activities, registry key changes to these particular registries are always great to watch for because it is very rare uh, that an actual administrator will need to go and start truncating logs. Um, not to say it doesn't happen, because I'm, as everyone in here is familiar, there are some very strange administrator behaviors you'll find, uh, run into every now and then. But these are two particularly great things to look for, both from the dead disk forensic side as well as live monitoring. So let's say you have actually seen this happen. What, what do we do about it now? Uh, so you want to go ahead and find the registry change stamps, timestamps mm -hmm. associated with uh, that activity. And again, go through your timeline, look at your other artifacts, try to piece together what else might have been going on at the time. And then we're just kind of falling back with the usual, well, you can try to carve EVTX chunks from disk memory. Yeah. Go through your standard process. Unfortunately, that's sort of the universal fallback for these things. 
if, you're, if you don't have good external logging sources that are being forwarded properly, you're almost always going to fall back to, oh, well, were you lucky enough to get a memory image? Can you get the event logs out of memory? Or are you lucky enough that there is unallocated space out there that have event log chunks that you can parse? Um, so, you know, I'm sure everyone here operates in environments exclusively that have perfect sim forwarding rules and event logging procedures that uh, you don't have to worry about that, but just in case. Well, and you're always detecting this like five minutes after. Right, that. exactly. This never happens. It's all fresh. So this is all, yeah, this yeah, never happens to you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, right, so one of the questions is why delete logs when I could just modify them? And sort of the, the thinking before was, well, you know, we can kind of do this. It's academically makes sense. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with individuals that do a lot of event logging tools. And the answer has always been, yes, it's trivial to, it would be trivial for me to do it, but why on earth would I ever make a tool that does this, right? Makes perfect sense. Why would you make it easier to do something like this than you need to? Um, but unfortunately, that's usually where the conversation stops. It's not that attackers aren't doing this. It's just that we don't release tools to make it easier for them. That said, there are, you know, using these existing forensic tools that all exist out there, uh, you can just use simple modifications to the code to turn a event log parsing utility into an event log rewriting utility. So. Um, right, so event log structure. So this is the 7,000 mile high overview. You have your uh, EVTX file separated into chunks, which consist of binary XML data. Um, each chunk has the first and last record numbers that are contained um, as offsets. And then there are two different kinds of checksums that you'll run into, the header checksum and the data checksum. And these checksums come into particular importance when you're talking about rewriting data uh, in order to mask the integrity having been manipulated. Uh, so the checksum is CRC32. Um, so obviously it's very simple. Everyone, you know, not a great, uh, too easy to manipulate and, and mask and sort of generate fake CRC32s that match um, in general. But that's not so much of an issue. Uh, so you take the forensic parser and you change it to, instead of, as it's parsing logs, look for pieces of evidence that you're interested in as, as a potential attacker. Maybe I don't like certain event logs, uh, event IDs showing up. I could target the event ID, I could target the record number if I'm interested in removing a particular event log, uh, which is exactly what the public tool out there does. Um, you could get more creative and look for strings and rewrite those strings before writing the event log back to disk. Uh, a lot of creative ways to do this on disk. A lot of ways to manipulate it and cover up the fact that it was manipulated, provided that you can get access to the file. And that sounds like a lot of fun if you're on the red team side. But if you're on the blue team side, you're probably having a little bit of heartburn right about now. Because, okay, it's one thing if the event log was cleared. It's another thing if I can say it was clearly resized and I know that stuff might have fallen off. But if I don't know, that it was modified in a suspicious way and that modification was then itself covered up, you know, I might be tearing my hair out trying to figure out what's going on here. So how can we actually detect this? Uh, you can look for utilities that might attempt to release locks on files since these are always in use by the Windows event logging system. Uh, the EVTX files themselves will, should always be locked. So if you see utilities dropped that go and unlock those, that might be a bit of a red flag. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would also look for events or events being logged saying, hey, this Windows event logging system stopped all of a sudden. That would be a nice uh, pointer in the right direction. Yeah, and, and one thing that is not going to leave any particular artifacts behind but is a possibility as well, just like you can parse data uh, forensically off of the raw disk, uh, you can also write to the raw disk to overwrite certain sectors. So. Uh, you don't, you don't always have to formally stop the, the service in order to access those disk, disk portions that you're looking for, um, but it's just something to be aware of. You're not gonna find any artifacts related to that since it's all at the disk level, uh, but something to be aware that it's not just stopping the service that here that's key. Yeah, and so um, what do we do about it? Well, assuming we've gotten to the stage where we think this actually happened and we're pretty sure we can start digging for it, in that case, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and maybe compare what's the event log on disk versus what was recorded in my sim, where those events hopefully got forwarded to beforehand. Uh, and if you do a little diff, you hold up the one, you hold up the other, and they don't match, you know that something fishy definitely occurred. And what it is that is the difference between those two 
might point you in the right direction, right. really pop out. Yeah. Uh, additionally, you can, of course, carve from memory, carve from disk, yep. carve and keep carving. Uh, maybe you've got volume shadow copies or you know, hard disk backups somewhere. I mean, you, swings you, the fences. Yeah, you might get lucky, so yeah, you, you may as exactly. well try. So um, one of the common threads here is that when you're dealing with modifications to the local disk event logs that are being parsed by all these forensic tools and incident response tools, well, the common response is, okay, if I have a sim and my logs are being forwarded, then I don't really care about any of this. Um, and the answer is yes, but. Uh, and the big but there is that uh, a lot of people set these up and get the logs forwarding and you know they have alerts and all these great things, but they don't have a great method to detect when the sim event log forwarders are not operating correctly. So uh, I, my sort of gut check self-assessment for sim logging is, if these three things happen, do you know about it? If someone stops the endpoint log forwarding service on my endpoint, do I know that that happened? If someone uh, changes a firewall rule or intercepts network communications to prevent my event log forwarding agent from getting event logs back to my central server, do I know about it? If a system hasn't forwarded logs in several days, do I know about it? The, for most people, the answer to these questions are no. You would have no idea unless you were actively looking for any attempt to subvert those sim logs from being properly forwarded and collected for review. Well, and ironically, if you did change the Windows firewall to drop all the packets forwarded from your event log forwarder, that would show up in the event log. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, there you go. Um, so one of the more interesting techniques that actually gets around this, uh, the idea of the sim sort of universally saving you is if we move off disk into memory. So recently there's been a lot of really great work out there, um, especially with WI event consumers and event tracing now has become uh, quite a popular topic for discussion. Um, so we're getting more insight into how these, the sort of provider consumer architecture works in uh, kernel town um, to get us the data that we look at uh, for the forensic artifacts. But um, high level overview, you basically have series of uh, chunks of data being passed from providers to consumers that eventually get written out to logs being passed through a series of APIs. Uh, and with a little bit of reverse engineering and in, you know, upstream memory hooking, uh, you can actually get the event log providers and consumers to do really interesting things with that information, uh, all in memory. So uh, simple uh, proof of concept tool and, and one caveat, obviously, um, so just to uh, lower any concern out there, we're not releasing any tools to do this. Um, this is not something that we're going to put out there. I wouldn't do that to you guys. Love you guys. Don't want to make your lives harder than they already are. Um, this is simply a proof of concept that uses uh, a debugging tool that we've developed um, over at FireEye that uh, allows you to do sort of malware analysis and in-memory in analysis as part of the reverse engineering process. So the example that we did was uh, we said, okay, what's one event ID that I don't want showing up in disk? So the one that we chose was the new process created event log. So tip, this is very typical to monitor. You're looking for process tree spawning. So I wanna see, okay, did PowerShell spawn something else? Well, then that's bad and I wanna go fix the problem. Um, so in this case, we picked an event ID and we said, I don't want that event ID to be written to disk anymore. So we uh, looked at the, the event logging service DLL uh, identified the necessary steps uh, in the process chain where the event log data gets passed down and identified the one call that takes the event log data and actually pushes it off the buffer into the disk or into the, the event log on disk. So using something like a, a debugger, any debugging tool can do this. Um, you can do this in any programming language on Windows. It's not that difficult. Um, but once you identify the necessary APIs to hook into, uh, you can basically tell it to do anything with that data. So in this case, we just completely skip over the fact that uh, the right, right to event log call is being made. Instead, we just say skip it and move on and go process other event logs. You can see a similar situation where we didn't just simply ignore writing it. We went in and actually changed the data that got written. Anytime a certain event log ID gets written or attempted to written to disk, we change the data and then we let that get written to disk instead. So it's a persistent in-memory method of altering or hiding event log data that uses this uh, provider-consumer relationship and seeks to interfere with it by uh, interfering in the API call chain. Yeah. 
extra dicey. Yeah. So now what do we do? <laughs> uh, outside of additional memory forensics, looking for, um, you know, hooking, uh, anything at that point. Right, crying. Uh, crying memory. mostly, yeah. yeah. Uh, lots of shame. There's, you know, you've got no disk artifacts for this. Uh, yep. You probably don't have any SIM data to correlate against because it's only going to forward what it has. Yep. And uh, it's, it's getting a lot tougher. Yeah. So the better option there is to just stop it from happening in the first place. Knowing that an attacker can go in and use ETW, use WMI, use these various consumer producer relationships within the Windows uh, architecture, we can do the same thing ourselves. Go in, create your own WMI implant to look for other WMI implants, or similarly with ETW, set up a trace to look for traces being set up. Uh, it's all very inception-y kind of yeah, right. really. We have to go one level deeper. Yeah, uh, chasing so your own tail mostly. It, going further upstream. It, so uh, event log tracing is particularly interesting um, and you'll actually see, I think, a lot of endpoint agents moving to event tracing as the source of events as opposed to event logs or event log related events. And the reason why is it is sufficiently upstream to make it much more difficult to tamper with. Um, you have a lot more capability to detect of people trying to tamper with it uh, with your event tracing and your WMI uh, event calls. Um, so it's going to become a lot more common, I think, uh, especially with live monitoring, to use that as the go-to source for event log data. Yeah. So some final thoughts. <laughs> uh, the primary goal of this talk is really just to shine a light on some maybe under-discussed topics within anti-forensics. So again, like, you know, time stomping is very well known, very well documented. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every, file deletion. Every other attempt. Right, file much. deletion, shell log history, deletion and removal. Um, all of these have been talked about uh, extensively at this point um, because some people wanted to bring attention to particular forensic artifacts that attackers are keen to avoid leaving behind. Um, and uh, you know, there was actually a great report that was just recently published by Japan CERT team that is a complete compendium of all event log IDs and related events for lateral movement in an environment. And it's an amazing resource. And these are all event logs that should be forwarded and collected and alerted on, but it relies on that ecosystem being preserved. And not a lot of thought gets put into making sure that event logs are being preserved. Um, we only just now started thinking about, well, how do I make sure that my WMI consumers are the ones I left there and not being modified or manipulated by an attacker? Um, the same attention should eventually get paid to events, um, either via event tracing modification or, or monitoring, uh, or some other further upstream check against this type of malicious behavior. This, this is all well and good because really, at the end of the day, if you have an attacker that's doing this to you, you already have a problem. Like, right. This is not the first source of a problem. Right. But that said, think about the kind of attackers where these few event logs are the only trace left of their activity, and even that, if they're cleaning them up, now they're, they're really low and slow. Right, we, we like our event logs a lot. I love event logs uh, as a red teamer. They're a constant source of frustration because obviously when we go out and red team for clients, we don't delete event logs because that's just not nice. Um, but real attackers don't have the same uh, dedication to quality service. Yeah. Um, so you'll find that they're a lot more sloppy with what they're willing to do to evade detection. And we can do the best that we can to try and prevent them from getting to that point. But at the end of the day, your best resource right now is going to be your SIM and your SIM logging. So making sure that you have the appropriate monitoring over those agents is going to go a long way. Just like you wouldn't want your endpoint agent to stop working and you not know about it until several weeks later, you want to know when your event log forwarding service has been stopped, right? You want to make sure that you don't run into a surprise later when you learn that your SIM doesn't have event logs from 300 of your systems because someone went and turned it off. So part of that's just good, um, good environmental safety in terms of uh, preserving the security ecosystem that you guys worked very hard to set up and that people like me are working very hard to circumvent and tear down. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we don't want anyone here to say, oh, well, throw event logs out, they're useless, someone can mess with them, because we don't do the same thing for file system artifacts, we don't do the same thing for shell, uh, shell bags, not logs. 
um, any of these other resources that are just as easily tamperable. Um, we just add a little bit of qualification and say, okay, here's the circumstances where I know obviously someone's tampering with it. Here are some circumstances where someone might be tampering with it. And just making sure that you know how to tell when someone's trying to lead you down the wrong path. And additional sim logging, live system monitoring through event tracing, those are all great methods to do that and make sure that no one's gonna get the best of you at the end of the day. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, like it's not very exciting to do telemetry and system health, but man, that really pays the bills. Yeah, it does. Um, so some things that I, I wanna make sure to, to do is uh, uh, muchas gracias to Michael Bailey, who actually helped quite a bit with the reverse engineering uh, of the event log DLL. Um, helped out with setting up Flare QDB for this. Uh, great resource, great guy. Highly recommend checking out his blog and Twitter. He's a phenomenal resource for reverse engineering, especially on the red team side of the house. And of course, uh, Willie Ballantine, who I'm sure gets thanked quite uh, frequently for his EBTX parser, which I used to uh, formulate my tool uh, that did this sort of manipulation, as well as the EB EBTX extract, um, which allows you to carve event logs from disk, which we also used as part of this. So, Two great re utilities that I highly recommend uh, using, especially if you want to learn more about the event log format on disk.